Okay. Okay. All right, so yesterday we got to, we're wrapping up Haiti. We were saying that Haiti uh, becomes independent in 1804 after the uh, fight off of, of Napoleon and his army. Um, after, after two, and it wasn't led by Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture had been captured already and was going to die not uh, long before this. And then, um, but the people left behind are going to fight for independence. So is everybody good on all the Haiti Revolution stuff now? Well, you, yeah, you will. Right. Okay, I made a video. Watch the video. Oh. All right. Lastly, the British opponents to the French Revolution. Uh, so because of France's Enlightenment impulses didn't match the violent reality of its actions, a lot of folks condemned the Revolution. So while, you know, the ideas of the French Revolution were inherently good, you know, government of the people and all that stuff, its violent actions did not match up with its ideas that greatly, and so a lot of folks criticize the uh, revolution. So, like Britain at this point, probably the closest other country to being, uh, you know, embracing of Enlightenment ideas and embracing different types of government. But it had never had this crazy of a revolution or this violent revolution, and so they very much looked down upon it. Plus, by this point, uh, Britain has very much settled into what kind of system here? Constitutional, constitutional monarchy. monarchy, right? So they're very much okay with constitutional monarchy by the 1790s. One of the most influential English writers at the time made comments about the revolution, a guy named Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke, this guy right here, who we're going to mention again later on, Edmund Burke uh, writes this book and reflected on the revolution. So his book, as you see, is Reflections on the Revolution in France. I know, right? So Burke writes this book, uh, Revelate Reflections on the Re uh, Re Revolution in France, but he's overall critical of the revolution, denouncing its, its nature in general because it was too violent. In it, he cautioned Great Britain against engaging in these types of excesses occurring in France. So he could, uh, cautioned Britain against engaging in these types of excesses occurring in France. He actually began writing his book, like when the revolution first began in 89. So he wrote it before the Reign of Terror. So his book comes out before Reign of Terror occurs. So it was before it got way out of control. We're gonna, huh? Was it He was in England now. So. I'm sure they wanted to cut his head off, but they couldn't, right? Anyway, um, we're gonna see Edmund Burr show up again later down the road um, in a later unit because he promotes a very conservative style of government. And what you need to understand at this time, when you say the word conservative, it doesn't mean what you think in a modern sense. Back then, around 1800, when they say conservative, they mean like a government that it essentially involves monarchy to some degree. So when you talk about government, it's used, like being conservative, it's usually referring to like some kind of system where you have monarchy or royalty or princes involved. So he promotes that kind of system in general, believing that was, that was better. Bur um, so he warned against anarchy in his book before the Reign of Terror, and it came to pass. Like he warned against anarchy occurring, which ended up coming to pass in the French Revolution. Great Britain managed to subdue its own radical reformers who demanded greater freedoms at home and for subjects abroad. So there was a little bit of a radical outbreak in Britain, but they were able to subdue those guys. Because overall, Britain, financially, how are they doing? They're great, right? What's been successful thus far for them? What's going on already for them? Colonies. Yes, the colonies, but they'll, they'll look at colonies too. Indu yeah, industrialization, right? They've already started industrialization at this point, so their economy's doing fairly well, and not, uh, they're not having to worry with a lot of these other issues there that other people are worrying with. So Britain's stable government and healthy economy allowed it to remain powerful peaceful and get rid of any kind of 
revolution mentality they had. Because certainly, the French Revolution ideas do spread to other countries, and it will have impact in various ways on other countries. But you know, Britain was very, very stable, and that was not going to undo it. Whereas France, as we know, was like way unstable and had a lot of problems in internally. Okay. <laughs> Moving on from the uh, revolution outside of France, heading back to um, back to France. Wait, yeah, never mind. Okay, that's right. Okay, all right. So we're going to now go back to uh, Napoleon. So Napoleon takes over uh, as dictator, but basically he does technically make a what for his first five years, not a dictatorship by himself. That 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 con the, the consulate or the triumvirate. So he calls it the con consulate, but in reality, it's like a triumvirate, like the Roman Empire, Roman Republic type deal. You have these essentially three dictators. He's named first consul, which means he's like the head dictator. So these three guys are running the show technically, but really it's who Napoleon. And overall. You know, you might say, well, France just went from having, like, republic to having, like, crazy head chopping off to having this very ineffective oligarchy, and now they're back to having one guy in charge. Why do you think that is? Right, they wanted to go with what would work. It was stability, right? And this is, they, this, he provides stability, which is what they like, right? So let's give a little history or background on Napoleon Bonaparte. He was born on the island of Corsica. So he was born on the island of Corsica. So if anybody ever asks you, um, never mind. Wait, I'm trying to have this phrased. Uh, if anybody ever asks you, uh, can you tell me about Napoleon's heritage? And you can say Corsican. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so he came from a very humble background. He was not royalty. He was not just like lord or whatever the case is. He went to French schools and a military academy. So he went to French schools and a military academy. And he kind of hits at the right time because he's a very young officer when the French Revolution wars break out. So when the wars break out in the early 90s, he's like a lieutenant, in the, which is like one of the lowest officers. And through his own merit and skill, he rises up to become a general very quickly. So he starts off like in these revolutionary wars as like a young officer, very you know a, like a low-ranking lieutenant, and very through his skill and strategizing, he's able to work his way up very quickly. By 1794, he is a general at the age of 25. So the age so age 25 and 94, he'll be a general in the army. And that's one of the benefits of how the revolutionary government changed its army, right? We talked about how it was more based on skill, not based on status or position. And that made it much more effective as a, um, as a military. But also, too, it made a lot of average people, or kind of regular people like, like Napoleon type, want to join because what could you get as, as a result of all this? Maybe not emperorship, right? But like, you know, you could work your way up in society and like make something of yourself. Um, so after, after saving the National Convention from Parisian mobs, he goes on to fight famously against Austrians in Italy. So he goes on to defeat the Austrians in Italy during the first uh, war, of the, war of the first, um, crap, I can't think of the stupid name, coalition. So he ends up defeating the Austrians in Italy uh, during the 1790s in the war of the first coalition. So he becomes a hero. Like this young general becomes a hero. You know, one of the earliest heroes of the French during the Revolution. He then decides to go invade Egypt. So in the late 90s, he decides to go invade Egypt, which will prove to be a disaster. Like he was trying to go invade Egypt for like their resources. It had also been uh, kind of colonized by the Europeans. They, like the British were there. So he goes to Egypt. He ends up getting defeated in Egypt. That's when he discovers what item? Rosetta, Rosetta Stone, right? Not him personally, but you know his campaign. But basically, before he 
before the news could travel back of his defeat and him get a negative perception, he like hurried back to beat the news after he lost in defeat um, and basically came back to seize power immediately. So after he was defeated in Egypt, he returned very quickly to France. And he suffered defeats both on land and at sea to the British. So as soon as he returned to France in 1799, he went ahead and staged his coup to overthrow the Directory. So he went ahead and staged his coup to overthrow the Directory. Which again, was not him by himself. There were people working within the government back home who wanted him in power, but they wanted him more as a what? Like a figurehead or like this, you know, just man. Because he was so popular, they thought they could kind of lead through him, but it turns out that he actually wanted to lead himself. So he comes in, makes this consulate, but in reality, he's really calling the shots as first consul of, uh, of France. So he becomes the first consul of the three-member consulate, the new governing body for five years from 99 to 1804. In 1800, he led his army against the Austrians again and won. So he keeps expanding their borders and keeps conquering more territory for France. So he goes against the Austrian forces again and wins. So he, he cements his power, but he also cements his celebrity. Like, a lot of average, regular people like Napoleon. So, like, I think this question came up yesterday, but, like, whenever he decides to become emperor, he, he literally takes a vote on it. He basically ha holds a vote to see if people approve of this decision, and they do. So people essentially vote to approve of him becoming the emperor whenever he chooses to do that in 1804. Make sure I have this spelling down correctly because I didn't write down my notes. But give me a second. Updating notes. All right. So the, the word is uh, plebis, plebiscite, or plebiscite. <clears throat> so essentially, he, this also happened in Rome too, so he does a lot of Roman type things, but uh, he held this nationwide vote that basically approved of him becoming emperor. In the it was like 70%, 70, 80% 70, voted yes, yes. Yes. So he held this national vote. So the definition of it is, it's a direct vote for all members of an electorate on an important public question such as change in the Constitution. So in this case, he's like, hey, I don't think this concept thing's working out. What if it was just me, you know, by myself? And they was like, yeah, you're awesome. Which again, you gotta be like, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, the people want it. They, they literally voted for it. So does it make does dictatorship does it make does it make it wrong then it's dictatorship? If they all said yes. Exactly. But the point is that like, you know, if, if that's what people want and the government's good then But it's the people's voice, right? They should have been better, right? Social artism, right? Be better. Exactly. Natural selection. Anyway, so he actually got named consul for life in 1802. So he, he, uh, he had the government name him consul for life in 1802, but that wasn't enough, and so he crowned himself emperor. And I do literally mean he crowned himself emperor. Like, he held the ceremony. He invited the pope to come out to, like, crown him emperor. And at the last moment, whenever the, the Pope was going to crown him, he took the crown from his hands and put it on his head himself to basically show that no man gave him this crown. Who gave him this crown? He did. <laughs> so he crowns himself Napoleon I in 1804, now emperor. No, next time here. All right, so that's his background. So he'll be emperor now for the next about... 10 plus years or so. We'll, we'll learn what happens. 
So let's go through his domestic reforms. So Napoleon wants to stabilize France after all the violent excesses of the revolution. So the first step is he takes that he creates the new civil code, uh, more commonly called the Napoleonic Code. So he creates the civil code of March 1804. We just usually call it the uh, Napoleonic Code. But this is also important too because he decides to make a civil law code versus like a common law code, which is what England had, right? America uses common law because England used that. What is common law based in? What idea? I mean, they're all influenced by natural rights and stuff, but how do the law, how do like the laws and precedents work in the common law? Right, basically court cases and precedents make decisions for you. You don't have to have everything written down, so to speak. It could be precedent that sets up how law works. In common law, it has to be what? It actually has, it has to be written down, right? So you can't have a series of court cases and everything else. In common law, it has to be in the law for it to be law. This goes back to like Roman times. So he basically takes a very, you know, old school mentality of like a, civil, a, a basic civil law code and updates it for Napoleonic France. So this Napoleonic law code was a body of law governing the people, property, and civil procedures. So it was a body of law governing people, property, and civil procedures. Prior to the, the new law code, France had a very confusing, disorganized um, set of regional regulations. So their law code was a mess. They had a lot of regional regulations and national regulations that didn't all coincide. So he decided to kind of streamline it to one massive law code. So that's, that's his big contribution. And many other countries will basically adopt, if not the same law code, a very similar system. And because of our heritage, what state has a Napoleonic S law code? Louisiana. Louisiana, which is why our law system is very different from everybody else, right? So the Napoleonic Code reinforced revolutionary principles by recognizing the equality of, of, of male citizens under the law. So the Napoleonic Code reinforced revolutionary principles by recognizing the equality of male citizens under the law. It also guaranteed religious toleration. So he also guaranteed religious toleration. Which the revolutionary government didn't really do that. They just promoted what? Dechristianization and atheism. It also protected property rights. So this law code helped to promote equality for all male citizens for guaranteeing religious toleration and for also protecting property rights. But the law codes that he makes for women are more restrictive than the revolutionary laws were. So women don't do well under Napoleon. Said about this. Yeah, he has a lot of flavor. For bros. Just because he's like a cool character that being such a person. Sure, yeah. Um uh, so anyway, so so this these are all the changes that he's making in general, but it's a big reform and many other countries will adopt a similar system after he makes this. Um where the civil law code is that where everything's written out very plain, straightforward, and he has one unified code for the entire country. Okay, uh, next looking at centralized government and merit system. So just like the military, he's going to basically adopt this idea of the government uh, also having a merit-based system too, where only the best people rise up through the ranks. So only the best people rise up through the ranks under his government. So Napoleon cr creates a very centralized bureaucracy. Napoleon creates a very centralized bureaucracy in which merit mattered more than ancestry or social position. So merit mattered more than ancestry or social position. So kind of like Peter the Great, like basically, if you entered into the military or the government, you could work your way up and become a very prominent role and 
have influence in France. He did invite back all those exiled no nobles that had left during the revolution, so he did invite back all those exiled nobles, as long as they pledged to do what? Right, well, pledge loyalty to him, right? So they, they, they had a pledge loyalty to him. So it led to a lot of those elites coming back and um, and getting positions in the government again. But he also made a new nobility too. So he had he invited back the old nobility as long as they were okay with him being emperor. But he also makes a new class of nobles as well too. So he creates a new imperial nobility to reward his most talented generals and officials. So he makes a new talented he he makes a new class of nobles. Uh, rewarding his most talented generals and officials. Which is even more than him, right? You can work your way up to nobility. But here's the difference, too. Isn't he going back to the old system of, like, letting them be exempt and have all these privileges and everything else? No. He learned that lesson, right? Or they, France learned that lesson. So that's the other thing he does, too. He also makes a very fair tax system. So he has a tax system where everybody gets taxed fairly. So his, he does develop a centralized tax system where everybody is taxed fairly. He also hired professional tax collectors to go out and collect the taxes. They would keep accurate records and not skim off the top. So he hired professional tax collectors to go out there, collect taxes, keep accurate records, and not take money from themselves. Shocking. Um, very carefully. I'm guessing there were some kind of training, some kind of skill to check into this. Are you trained or not? Question. I guess so. I guess people have the reputation or, 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 you know, who are well known to basically produce the right amount of money or whatever the case is. But yeah, I mean, that's, I guess you also have the expectation. And also, too, if you make incentives, obviously, you can work your way up. So that's probably also for as well, too. Anyway, um, so he inherited a lot of debt and a lot of problems from the revolution. So because of a very efficient system, he's able to gradually France out of all these problems. So he's able to, to gradually reduce expenses of the government and increase revenues and help stabilize his economy post-revolution. Which is great because that just means more money for his wars, right? All right. Next, we're going to look at the uh, educational system. The educational system. Under Napoleon, even these French schools, French schools called uh, lycees, lycees, I mean lyceum. So he opens up these schools for guess who? Women. Not women. Only boys, yeah. So these open up for boys 18 to 16. So basically it's not the, the licensees were not like base primary school. Like you would still go to like a primary school and get basic writing, read those kind of things. But this was a, a, a school for average people to go to. So the middle class now had an, an avenue for more education opportunities. For at least the men. Is it like military in Japan? Uh, no, it didn't necessarily make you... The military kind of structured a little bit, but it wasn't necessarily a guy. The YCs, um gave ed, middle class more education opportunities. With the idea that the men who would go through the training for six years and take a role in their government or the military. For being in for six years, they would go on to be a member of the military or the government. Scholarships were even given to those who couldn't go to attend. So scholarships were even given to those who were to attend. But why do that? Why be so generous with 
to make him think he's so what else, Jerry? Correct, you want to educate a uh, uh, type of professional running your gun. Also, just like school does now, it helps to make do what to you over time. Yeah. Yes, what is what? Indoctrinate, right? Indoctrinate them to believe in Napoleon, and he is, right? So basically, you're creating, it's like Hitler Youth, basically. You're making people develop and believe these ideas. So from an early age, you've been painted with, like, I doubt, you know, the Constitution, liberty, and freedoms of the great idea of America. Capitalism is the bees, right? Right? This is recorded, right? No! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, see, so like that's part of you've been indoctrinated your you know your whole life. Same thing here. They're making a generation of kids who believe in William's ways and ideas, you know, right? Smart. <laughs> hey, look, Germany did a lot of what? Who they from? Ooh. 